Please turn back in your Bibles to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, we will be looking at, for our text this morning, verses 11 through 15. Beginning at verse 11. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers, that I've often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented. Sorry. In order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Let us pray together before we begin. Our great God and Father, we thank you for blessing us with your word. And just as we sing, Lord, we ask that you would speak. Lord, we are here to listen to your word. We desire, Lord, to hear, Lord, what you have to say to us. We ask that your word would be planted deep within our hearts. We pray this morning we would not merely be motivated or inspired, we ask that you would do a supernatural creating work of working in our hearts, creating us a clean heart, renewing in us a right spirit. We pray that we would have your vision, your goals, that the mind of Christ would be evident in the holy pages of scripture and that that would be the the mind that we have. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would be in the midst of your people and that the sword of, of your spirit, the very word of God, would, would instruct us and guide us. We ask this in your name. Amen. The last uh, two Sundays, we've been looking at this epistle to the Romans in chapter 1, and we're going to continue on one more message, at least, um, for this kind of three-part message together. And I try to make each mes- message stand alone, so um, you didn't necessarily have to be here for the prior messages Um, to make it a a message in and of itself. But we just have been going along from verse to verse in a sense. And so this is our our next passage. Um, One of the reasons, for for many reasons, I chose the book of Romans to look at for these three services is Romans is not simply the first letter of the epistles because, um, or it's not the first letter of the epistles because that's the first letter Paul wrote. He probably wrote 1 Thessalonians or Galatians first. But the church has always seen Romans to be the first of the epistles because it is the preeminent epistle. It is first in preeminence. And this is no overstatement. Romans is one of the, probably the greatest letter ever written, the greatest thing ever to be penned. And so this is a wonderful piece of scripture. It's greater than any book, any piece of literature, any poem, any other thing ever to be written so it's worthy for us to give it consideration and so I encourage you this morning to to give yourself give your energies to consider this letter with me to try to grasp the truths that are found in this book and what we did in our prior messages some dating back to last year so I don't expect you to remember that is we looked at the beginning of Romans who wrote Romans why um who he wrote the letter to and now we're going to look at why did he write it Why did he write the letter to to the Romans? And the first two questions were were pretty easy to answer. Who wrote Romans? You see in verse 1, Paul, and he describes himself. And we looked at three, I think, messages on that. And then we looked at who did he write it to? Obviously, he wrote it to the Christians over in Rome. And we, we spent a message looking at what it means to be a Christian in a sense. How did he describe them? And now what we're going to do is is much more difficult, is we're going to look at why did he write it? And he doesn't explicitly just come out and say, this is why I'm writing to you. And so we're going to have to do some work in trying to figure out why he wrote this. And we are not doing this 
to, so that we can better understand Romans. And that, that is a very good reason to do what I'm doing. But that is not the reason we are going to do this. The purpose of why we're going to try to look at why did Paul write to the Romans, what was his intention, is because there's a radical implication to that purpose for why he wrote. And that is why we're going to do this. We want to see why did he write to the Romans, what was his goal in writing to them. And if you miss this purpose of why he wrote to the Romans, you're going to miss the letter to the Romans. And more than that, you're going to miss the, the goal of the church. And in, in a sense, not more than that, but more experientially, you're, you're going to miss the reason why you exist. And so this has huge, radical implications. This will affect what you think about your life, how you spend your time, your money, your retirement. This has huge implications. And so we need to first do the, the hard work. The hard work, we're going to have basically two points. First point, very simply, why did Paul write to the Romans? That's point one. Point two, the radical implication of Paul's reason for writing to the Romans. Those are our two points. And so first we need to do the hard work, and often we don't like to do hard work. And so I, I beseech you, I encourage you, please stick with me, the first part of this message, to understand point one. You might think, I don't really care why Paul wrote to the Romans. Um, I hope I hope when we get to point two, you'll, you'll care why he wrote to them. And so this is not an academic exercise at, at all. That's not the purpose. I, I really want you to see this point so we can go on to point two of what's the implications. Point number one, why did Paul write to the Romans? As we said, this is a harder question to answer. Who he wrote to, who wrote, those are easy. Why? Why did he write? It's going to take a little more work. I don't know if you guys remember high school math. And, and this is not going to be like high school math. If you hated your high school math class, I hope not. Um, in high school math, um, I love my high school math classes. And in the back of the book was all the answers. And I think when I first got there, I was shocked. I'm like, they put all the answers in the back. This is so easy. Not realizing that often, if you're dealing with calculus, um, the answer is not the hard thing. It's trying to get to the answer and show how to get there. And sometimes the answer in the back frustrated you because you couldn't get to that answer. And so in, it's kind of a similar model. Paul gives us hints in chapter 1, what I just read. It was there, some of the hints. But he really doesn't fully answer the question until you get to the end of the letter. When you get to the end of the letter, about midway through chapter 15, he kind of closes out the letter. And yet there's another chapter and a half left. The rest of chapter 15 and chapter 16, he greets a ton of people there in Rome. He gets to the end of the letter, and then he starts to kind of divulge, here's why I'm writing to you guys. He gives more clarity. And so let's look at these verses in chapter 1, and then we'll go to the back of the book and see, okay, here's, here's the full answer. In Romans chapter 1, what we just read, is we see that Paul says in verse 7, we looked at last week, that he has been praying that he would at last succeed in coming to them. And so we see that he is praying and praying that he wants to go to Rome. He has longed, he says he's often intended to come to them and has thus far been hindered, you see, in this first chapter. Now, why did he want to see the Romans? Why did he want to get there? He says that in chapter 1, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. And so he wanted to impart to them some spiritual gift. He didn't know exactly what was going on in Rome. He had some reports. In chapter 16, you see, he knew a lot of people there. He had information. And so he addresses some of those issues in Romans. But he didn't know exactly what was happening. So whatever they needed, that was what he wanted to give them in a sense. That's why he says some spiritual gift. I want to impart something to establish or strengthen you. Or in a sense, kind of like to be like that tree in Psalm 1. He wanted to see that picture in them. That you guys would be firmly planted by streams of water. Yielding fruit in its season. And whatever you do, you would prosper. That's what I want to, to impart to you guys, some spiritual gift to establish, to strengthen you over there in Rome. That's my goal. But then he kind of almost corrects himself, and this is important to see. He says in Romans 1, verse 12, that is, that we may mutually encourage each other. I think it's the only place that's found in the New Testament, this phrase. He says kind of, that is, almost correcting himself to say, I want to impart to you something, but, but not to say you guys have something to impart to me. I have something to give to you, and you guys can very much also give to me, help me. And so that remember that. We'll come back to that when we get to the end of the book. He continues to say that I want to come to you not only to strengthen you guys, but that I would reap a harvest among you. 
that I would reap a harvest of souls to see people added to the church that have yet been added. God has people there in Rome. And so I want to establish you guys. I want to reap a harvest because, guys, I didn't, as the apostle to the Gentiles, he's saying, didn't forget the, the capital city of the Gentiles, Rome. I haven't forgotten you. I, I long to get there. I long to see you guys. I feel obligated to preach the gospel to everyone. And so I'm eager to come to you if you have thought otherwise of me. In a sense, maybe Paul was kind of came to the point and said, I, I'm sick of trying to get to Rome. I'm going to just write to them. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to pen a letter to them and I'm going to tell them what I would say to them if I did get to them. And he sits down and he starts to dictate this letter as Tertius writes it down for him. You see in chapter 16, Tertius says, I write this down. So why hasn't he come? What's been hindering Paul? What was his great goal in trying to get to Rome? Why did he so want to get there? How could the Romans encourage Paul? How could they mutually encourage each other? The answers, like I said, are in the back of the book. So let's turn to the back of the book, Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And let's look at those three questions I just said. Those three questions. First, what has been keeping Paul from Rome? What has been keeping him preoccupied? Read with me Romans chapter 15, verse 18. Romans 15, 18. He says here, For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. So he says, in a sense, I, I could have come to you guys, but I've been busy. I've been busy with my to, trying to fulfill the ministry that Christ has given to me, telling those who have never heard the gospel, bringing to the gospel to those who have never understood, to, to witness, to establish a gospel witness throughout this whole area. And this is my ambition, not to build on someone else's foundation, he says, but to go where it's never, been, never gone before. And this is, in a sense, almost not just his ambition, it's become his, his policy. He most re refuses to say, you know what, someone else is built there? Okay, my job, my mission is to get the gospel where it's never been before. Remember what the Lord told Ananias after he um, appeared to Paul, or Saul of Tarsus? And he said, go, there's this man praying, he's blind. And he says, Lord, I, I heard of this man and I don't want to go. And listen to what the Lord said to him. He says, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Paul was specially called to be the apostle to the Gentiles, or to, that the same word is nations, to the nations, to carry the gospel, to, in, a, in part, to fulfill that great commission that Jesus gave, the risen Lord. He said to go into all the world and preach the gospel. This is what he told his people. And this was particularly Paul's calling and mission and goal in life. And so you see him trying to carry this out. So our question, what was hindering Paul? We see he was busy bringing the gospel to those who had not yet heard. And also, it was his policy not to build on another man's foundation. So the gospel had already gone to Rome, obviously. He's writing to Roman Christians, to those people out there in Rome. And so somehow the gospel reached them, uh, most likely probably from the day of Pentecost. You remember when Peter was preaching 
And the people were amazed, and they said, we, every one of us hear it in our own language. And it goes and lists all of these places. All these people were gathered from all over. And the very last, it says, and there were visitors from Rome. And so they probably heard from Peter, and they went back home. And then churches were, were, were started and established. And so Paul says, there is a gospel witness. So my job, I've been busy, and you guys already have a gospel witness. But there's a third reason that was, was keeping him from going. He was busy also with bringing a collection from amongst the Gentiles to the church in Jerusalem, the poor Jewish church in Jerusalem. And it was more than just to meet the, the, the needs of the poor, which it was. But you can read about this in, in First and Second Corinthians. And he, he actually writes a lot about this. Chapters 8 and 9 in Corinthians, the whole chapters, he's devoted to this idea of this collection. It had theological implications. As we talked about before, the Jews and Gentiles were brought into one body. And this was a great and beautiful picture that the Gentiles were now coming and saying, here, Jews, we want to support you. We are one body. And so he says, I've been busy with this. Listen in Romans 15 as he gives us more answers. Romans 15, verse 25. 15, verse 25. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. And so you see here, He's been preoccupied. He has many things on his plate in a sense. This is what's hindered him thus far from coming to them. That's why he says, I've longed to see you. I've I've been prevented. So let's move on to that second question. I said, what was that second question? Not only what's preventing him, but what was Paul's great goal? What was his great goal in coming to Rome? And this moves us closer to this radical implication. Look at verse 22. Verse 22, Romans 15, 22. I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. And so you see, he longs to go to Rome. He says, but in passing, I, I didn't plant that church. I didn't establish that church. I'm not trying to build on another man's foundation. Paul was very sensitive to that. But he says, I'm going to come to you. And in chapter 1, he longs to see them. And in chapter 15, we find out more fully, I, actually, I want to get to you guys so then I can get to Spain. That's my ultimate goal. That's where my eyes are, are set on. He says in verse 28, look at verse 28. When, therefore, I have completed this Um, this collection he's referring to, to to Jerusalem, and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. And so here's Paul's travel itinerary. He says, right now, immediately, I'm going to Jerusalem to deliver the collection, and then I plan to go to Rome just in passing, and then I plan to go to Spain. And if he kept writing, I think he would probably say, and then to the ends of the world. I want to get to Spain and what becomes later France and and Germany and Britain and and, and keep going west as far as I can see. So what kept him? His missionary endeavors, these works. What was his goal? It was ultimately to get the gospel to probably what he saw as the ends of the world in his his geography then to Spain. Third question I mentioned. What was that third question? How could the Roman Christians possibly encourage him? Some commentators think he was, it was more of kind of, um, um, he was being nice to them. You know, I, I, I want to um, encourage you guys, and we can mutually encourage each other that they had nothing to offer to Paul. I think this is to miss the point completely. Listen to what he says again in verse 24, chapter 15, verse 24. I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you. Once I've enjoyed your company for a while. And he uses this word helped. I want to be helped by you. And this word 
uh, turn real quickly or, or listen carefully to Titus. Look at Titus uses the same exact word, help. Listen now, Titus uses this word, or Paul writing to Titus. In Titus chapter, 13, um, chapter 3, verse 13, he says this. Do your best to speed Zinnius and the, the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. To, to send, send them on their way or to, to push them forward, or as he says in here in Romans, to help. He says, so that they lack nothing, help them. Help them out so that they can continue to go forward. Um, in Third John, it says the same word again, the same Greek word. It says, Paul writes to, um, John writes, Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testify to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey. That's the same word here. Send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. And so he says, guys, I want to come in in passing, and and you guys can help me. You guys can help me. In a sense, he's saying, I want you guys to be my Antioch. Would you be my next Antioch? Antioch supported me, sent me out, and I came back to them. They were my sending church, my supporting church. Would, would you, Romans, be my Antioch? And so you could then send me farther, send me out even farther. So to end this first, first point, this hard work, why did Paul wrote, write the letter to the Romans? In a sense, it's almost like he's writing to their missionary board. He's saying, I'm requesting your help, your aid. Would you guys send me out in a way worthy? Would you support me in getting the gospel to the ends of the earth? Therefore, the Romans had every right to say, what's your credentials? What exactly is the gospel that you are preaching? And if, as you read through Romans, it becomes apparent that they heard things about Paul that were, were not the most appealing. He says in Romans chapter 3, he says, why don't we do good that evil may abound? As some people slanderously charge us with saying. You've heard probably reports about my message. And in Romans chapter 2, verse 16, he says, according to my gospel. And so this is Paul's gospel. You want to know his credentials? You want to know what he is about, what he's preaching? Here is the letter to the Romans. The letter to the Romans as he presents it to them. So let's move on to our second and last point. The radical implications of Paul's reason for writing to the Romans. The radical implications of Paul's reason for writing to the Romans. And we're going to look at this under two subheads, two subpoints. We'll look at this. Number one, the connection between worship and witness. The connection between worship and witness. John Piper, in his book, Let the Nations Be Glad, wrote this. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. There is a vital connection between worship and witness, our our, our missions. And and if this is missed, so much of our Christian life is missed. Not simply for missionaries, but for all of us. I had had a friend who was going to become a missionary and go out on the mission field, and I gave him this book by John Piper, Let the Nations Be Glad. And two years later, he called me up after two years of being on the mission field. And he said, I, I have to confess to you, honestly, I, I, I took that book and I, I tried. I tried to read it and I just couldn't get into it. I just, 
He was speaking a different language. I just didn't see what he was saying. And he said, and then two years later, through different circumstances, I picked it up again, and then I started to see. I started to see through the pages of scriptures the glory of God everywhere. And, and he was a, a good man. He would go door to door throughout his neighborhood, um, working a secular job, and he would share with, with people Christ. He longed to see people saved. But in his mind, he wouldn't articulate this, but in his mind, missions was ultimate, not worship. And that's why he couldn't quite get into the book. He told me at that same time someone had given him, I think his brother-in-law gave him a, um, a, a series of teachings called a Cat and Dog Theology. Cat and Dog Theology. And he said this illustration was given of some people are like cats and some people are like dogs. And he said some people, they're like cats. They think that their master exists for them. Their master exists to meet every one of their needs, every one of their um, wants to scratch their back so they can rub against them. And then there's some people that are like dogs in a positive way. They think, I exist for my master. I, I light up when my master comes home. I, I rush to see him. My whole life is, is, is revolved around him. I exist for, for, for him. He doesn't exist for me. I exist. I depend on him. And my friend, he, he started to see a, a radical shift in not only missions, but in, in all of his life. And we see this connection in Paul between worship and missions. Look again at Romans 15. Look at what Paul says here. He saw himself surprisingly as a, like an Old Testament priest. It's the only time I think ever in the New Testament this kind of picture is given um, in, in this sense, at least. Romans chapter 15, verse 16. He says, To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles or to the nations in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And we see this picture taken from the Old Testament that the priests, they were commissioned with this um, sobering, serious job of bringing, presenting the worship of God to God himself on behalf of the nations. And it was to be sanctified. It was to be a holy sacrifice. And this is kind of the, the picture Paul is bringing before us. Not that he is bringing any type of atoning sacrifice at all. The, the sacrifice is the nations, the people, the Gentiles. He says, I, I see myself like this priest who I'm coming before the courts of God with, with my offering. And it's the, the nations, the people of God. And I desire for them to be holy and sanctified before God. To see all the people gathered as an act of worship before God. To lift them up before God. And say every tongue, every tribe, and every nation is presented before you in this act of worship. I'm not going to present you the, the blind and the lame are, are, are my leftovers. We desire the church and the people of God to be a pure, spotless bride without any wrinkle, without any blemish, because this is a worshipful act to God, to lift up this church and say, God, this is our act of worship. This is what you have done, a people full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. That's what he said about the Romans in this chapter here. And we're part of that. We don't think of ourselves as missionary territory, but some missionary came here and brought the gospel after Paul very likely made it to Spain. We don't know for sure, but probably did make it to Spain eventually, maybe after he was released, um, went to Spain, then maybe probably was um, prison, imprisoned again before he was killed. But we see the gospel then was taken eventually throughout France and, and, and Germany and, and Great Britain, and, and it came here. And we are part of that Gentile offering largely. To say, this is an offering to you, God, before you. We, have, we were a pagan people, idolatrous people that have been sanctified, have been set apart for your sake. And this is your work. As Paul said, I won't boast about anything but what Christ has done. This is the fruit of your hands, God. We planted and we watered, and, and God, he caused the increase, and he spread the gospel throughout the world, and he is doing that. Listen closely to what John Stott writes. If God desires every knee to bow to Jesus and every tongue to confess him, 
so should we. We should be jealous for the honor of his name, troubled when it remains unknown, hurt when it is, it is ignored, indignant when it is blasphemed, and all the time anxious and determined that it shall be given the honor and glory which are due it. The highest of all missionary motives is neither obedience to the Great Commission, important as that is, nor love for sinners who are alienated and perishing, strong as that incentive is, especially when we contemplate the wrath of God, but rather zeal, burning and passionate zeal for the glory of Jesus Christ. That is the connection between worship and witness, our worship and missions. Let's look at our second subpoint, our last subpoint. The beautiful fruit of this connection. Let's look at the beautiful fruit of this connection. Now, if you lost me, real quick summary. Paul wrote to the Romans because he longed to see them help him further the gospel to the ends of the world. It was his passionate zeal to see the name of Christ honored amongst all people of the world. And that zeal should drive missions. And so what's the implications of that thought? The implications, and before we get to them, it's not just for missionaries. This vision should drive all of us. If you guys um, probably have heard stories of World War II, um, most of us you know, cannot re- remember it. I heard um, Vince Scully, the, um, the old-time voice of the Dodgers, he tells wonderful stories. Obviously, I heard him on the radio. And um, he was talking about World War II, and he was old enough to remember. And walking through his neighborhood, and I never heard this, maybe, maybe I wasn't paying attention, but any of my history classes or um, seeing the blue stars in the windows. I didn't know what he was talking about. And if you had a soldier, someone in your family was in battle, you would hang a little flag in your window, and it was a blue star. And how, how united the country he felt was. And, and then you would see someone might have a, a blue star or two, and then they would have a gold star. And they had lost someone in the war. And he talked about just how sobering it was and how the, the country was, was so t- together. And you saw people are, are dying. People are, are battling. They're fighting. And so what were you motivated to do as the average person? You, you rationed because the country said, please ration, we need the resources. You bought bonds so that you, you, you could help support the cause. You did everything you could to say, people are shedding their blood, they're dying, and so this isn't just about those on the front line. Every one of us has to support. Every one of us comes together and says, this is our cause. This is what we've been called to. And, and some people enlisted. Some people, they gave their all. There's a great need for all types of people in the church, a tremendous need for all types of people. Obviously, most of us are not going to be like the Paul apostles, the the apostle Pauls. We're not going to necessarily be those um, pioneer missionary types, and those are desperately needed today. It's not like that's been accomplished and it's done. That work of planting, I just read on the, um, according to the Joshua Project, you can go online and check Joshua Project, it says that there are 17,000 people groups in the world. 17,000 people groups with their own language, they would designate as a separate people group. Seven, over 7,000 of them are listed as unreached. 7,000, uh, according to probably what Paul would say here, I fulfilled the gospel from Jerusalem till Illyricum. All that area, I I filled up my ministry. Obviously, everyone didn't hear, but he probably planted churches so there was a gospel witness in that whole area, that man. There are 7,000 people groups who don't have that, who don't have enough Christians, a strong enough witness to say the gospel has gone there and they can now evangelize their area. So there is desperate need for the Paul, Paul the Apostle type people. There are people that probably have heard of Coca-Cola never heard the name Jesus Christ. That, that, that's hard to fathom. 
And so we, we def, definitely need to say that there is still that need. This is what drove Paul to write this in Romans 10, 14. Listen to the message of Romans. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him in whom they have never heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And so we need to pray to the Lord of the harvest like we have in our prayer bulletin. That should be uh, highlighted in our our minds to say we need to pray to the Lord of the harvest to, to send forth, to raise up workers. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. That hasn't changed. We need to, to give to support those or consider going ourself. If we're called, would we be ready? Are you preparing yourself? You say, I'm ready. I, I am preparing myself. I am teaching myself how to pray. I, I'm studying God's word so I can communicate it in a better way. I am serving diligently in the church. If you're not serving here, then there's no chance you probably think I'm going to go serve in a diff- more difficult situation. Financially, I'm, I'm trying to support. I, I am living that World War II war-style lifestyle to say, I, I want to ration. I want to support the cause because we have a much bigger cause at hand. Physically, I want to be ready and fit and, and, and able. Remember um, Jim Elliott. I can't remember exactly how the story went, but um, he was not only a, a great missionary, but he was also a, a very good wrestler. And he, he won a title. I don't know if it was a state title or national title, but he wrote to his parents saying, uh, you may have heard of, of an award I, I won. And I just want to let you know that God said to present your body as a living sacrifice. And I wanted to present the, the best I could. And so he disciplined his body as well as his mind and his spirit. And to say, I, I want my body to be healthy so I, I can do more for the kingdom. It's not just the missionary. It should be all of us to, to govern our life and think in this way. But obviously, we're not all like the Apostle Paul, um, probably very few, which we need more. But there may be some Timothys like that. Timothy was sent to a, a foreign area, to, to Ephesus, and to stay there and help them. It wasn't a, pl- a place that hadn't been reached. It was a reached place. But Paul said, go stay in Ephesus, help them. And there are many missionaries go to places where the gospel has been known, but they don't have all the, the resources and help and aid that we have. And there's, there's need for that. There's need for the Paul types, for the, the Timothy types, and there's need for the, the Roman types. And this probably is, is most of us. There's need for people to say, please support me, send me. Paul says here in verse 30, chapter 15, verse 30, strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Strive with me. This is a labor. We're all working together. Would you strive with me? Would you help me? And that should be our mindset when we come this afternoon to pray for our missionaries. We, we shouldn't see it as, oh, you know, I have no idea who these people are. Let's, let's try to find out who they are. Let's try to find out about their areas. Let, let's strive with them in prayer. Paul knew a lot of the people in Rome somehow, d- dozens of them he mentions in chapter 16, and yet there's many people he never knew. And he's asking all the church, people I've never met, please, most of them he didn't know. Strive with me in prayer because this is not Paul's special cause. This is not just this missionary's special burden. This is God's heart. And so this should be our heart. This should be our burden. We should desire to see God honored amongst the people of the world. We should need to see ourselves as all farmers and workers, laborers. Paul gives two pictures. He says one plants, another waters, a, a agricultural picture, and he also gives an idea of a building. He says, I don't want to build anybody else's foundation. He says, some people like Apollos, that's good. That's nothing wrong with that. He is now to water. He is now to build on this foundation that was established, and that's what many people do. But we should all see ourselves as part of the job, not the missionaries are doing it, the pastors are doing it, Listen to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Listen carefully to verse 12. Why did he give pastors and teachers? To equip the saints for the work of ministry or service, for building up the body of Christ. 
And we need to all see ourselves that way, that we are all part of this, that we, that we are to be equipped so then we can build up the body of, body of Christ. What part do I play in the great cause? Have that missionary mindset here in this mission field. And then maybe if it really captures, it will go out to other places. You might be thinking, well, I'm, I'm just a mom trying to um, keep my own boat afloat right now. That's my wife uses that phrase. Take care of my kids, and I mean, what can I really do? That's your territory. Those kids. See it as a mission. See it as, God, help me to teach them the gospel. Help me teach them to pray. Help me to pray with them. Help me to pray for them. Help me to prepare them. Help me to help them see this, this world vision that you have. Help me to, to show them to in some way, help them to feel the hurts for the nations, to not be myopic. Read to them great biographies. Open up their vision. Prepare them that maybe one day they would be called to the ends of the earth. You say, I'm just a mother or, or a father. What can I contribute? Perhaps you can contribute the greatest thing. You could say, God, this is my child. I give him to you like, like Hannah did. Use this child for your glory. If your child came to you and said, I want to be a missionary, would your heart rejoice? I know some parents, they try to talk their child out of that. Listen to this letter from Adoniram Judson. He sent it to Anne Hasseltine's father, asking for her hand in, in essence for marriage. Adoniram Judson was the, the first, I believe, American um, missionary or Baptist missionary to go out. Before he went out, he was trying to court Anne, and she put him off, and then she finally said, ask my dad, and immediately he wrote this letter out to the father. I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world. Whether you can consent to her departure and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life. Whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to disregard, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you, for the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God? Can you consent to all this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with the crown of righteousness, brightened with the acclamations of praise which shall redound to her Savior from heathens saved through her means from eternal woe and despair. And what would you say if you got a letter like that asking for your child's hand? Her father said, it's, it's, it's your choice, Anne. Girls, what would you say if you received a proposal like that? Listen to what Anne wrote to her friend. I feel willing and expect, if nothing in providence prevents, to spend my days in this world in heathen lands. Yes, Lydia, I have about come to the determination to give up all my comforts and enjoyments here, sacrifice my affection to relatives and friends, and go where God in his providence shall see fit to place me. And we don't have time to read the many passages, but um, and read it later the end of Matthew chapter 19. Remember when Peter said, Lord, we've left everything, houses and father and mother and children. What's there for us? He basically says, you, you've left nothing. You, you gained everything. Three real quick points. I know we're out of time. Our last, to how, what's the beautiful fruit of this vision? Three practical things. Number one is prayer. We pray. 
because it's his work. That's what Paul says. I won't boast about anything, he says in this passage here in Romans 15, except what Christ has wrought in me, what he's done. We pray because it is his work. We water and plant, but God is the one who causes the growth. We pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers because it's his job. It's his work. And so we pray, and we not only pray, we pray confidently because it will be accomplished. Jesus said on the sermon on the... um, the Olivet Discourse, sorry. He says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And so we pray with confidence because we're not depending on weak, changeable men to carry this work out. We have great confidence that the immortal God will carry this work, make it to to completion. Paul says that he hid this treasure of the gospel in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness would be of God and not of man. And so we see this work will be accomplished. And so we pray confidently and we pray earnestly. We pray earnestly because we see the connection between worship and witness. If you long to see God's name honored, then you will pray earnestly Lord, there are places in the world that have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. That should cause us to to pray. That should drive us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Second, not only do we pray what we give, we give. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. What we are willing to give up shows that how much we value something. I remember when I went to Trinidad, and some of our good friends, they were, they're Hindus, and they wanted to take us and show us what they had built, this massive Hindu god there of, um, I don't know, it was 40 feet tall, or it, it was huge, it looked like this, this big monkey. And that wasn't shocking. That wasn't what shocked me. What I'll never forget is they told me, and very matter of factly, they gathered all the gold so they could have a gold platform for this idol. And they took their wedding rings and contributed that to melt down so that they could have a platform for the idol. And I saw how much they were devoted to this. And we're willing to give up almost everything. What you're willing to give up shows how much you value something. And when you see this connection between worship and witness, you see, like I said, we, we've given up nothing. Every time we give up, we're, we're, we're getting back. It's like that man buying that field. He sells everything for joy. He says, look at the value. Martin Lloyd-Jones, I, I think I've told this before, he, he did not often like to talk about how he left this great prestigious career of a medical doctor. He was in line to be the doctor, I believe, to the royal family. And he left that to go preach in a very poor city in Wales. And he didn't like to talk about it because he didn't want people to make much of him because that wasn't his message, that he was a man who sacrificed a lot. His message was about a God who sacrificed his son. That's the focus he wanted the message on. He said, I gave up nothing. I received everything. I count it the highest honor that God can confer on any man to call him to be a herald of the gospel. And some people gave up far more than a prestigious career. Remember what Paul said to the Ephesians? He says, and now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and affliction await you. But I do not count my life of any value nor as precious to myself if I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And I, and I exert, exhort you that we, we should all see our life that we have a course. We are not Apostle Paul's, but we have a course. And if you count your life dear to yourself, if there are more, things more precious to you than pleasing your master, then you will not finish that course well. And say, we are all part of this work, and we have a course set out before us, and we are to give our, our very life. We're to give our life in worship to God to say, this is the reasonable response to Romans. 
Romans 12, 1, to offer up yourself a living sacrifice, holy and blameless before him. On October 28th, Jim Elliott wrote what's in your bulletin there in his diary. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And then he wrote this, Luke 16, 9, that when it shall fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. That's the verse from the parable of the dishonest manager. Remember the story Jesus said that this Businessman business man basically calls in his manager and says, I found out you've been unfaithful, and so he's going to fire him. And so the manager starts to think and plot. He says, you know what, I, I, I'm too weak to, to work really hard. I'm too proud to beg. I know what I'll do. And he starts to call in the debtors. And he says, how much do you owe my master? And he says, 100 measures of oil. And he says, write down 50. And he says, how much do you owe my master? And he says, 100 measures of wheat. He says, write down 80. And then the businessman finds out. He compliments him. He praises him. He says, for his shrewdness. He said, you know, the people of this world are more shrewd than those of the kingdom. And he ends with this application. Jesus says, you can't serve two masters. You have to serve either God or money. And money is not an evil. Money is a tremendous, powerful tool. But it has great dangers to it. Money can cause us to get comfortable in this life and miss the mission. Instead of seeing it as a powerful, great tool to say, how can I advance the kingdom? What can I do for the gospel's sake? How can I see the temporary pleasures of this life are not worthy to be compared to an eternal harvest of souls? And Jesus said, be shrewd in how you use money. Make friends for yourself in heaven. Don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust is going to destroy and thieves are going to break up and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven. He says, where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves can't break in and steal. But where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And finally, last third not only do we pray not only do we give but we suffer we suffer this is how we apply this truth in acts when they were beaten and they suffered you can read acts chapter 5 later on it says that they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name and this is what we need to see This is a beautiful application because it shows the greatness of our God. What we're willing to suffer for shows how worthy he is, how honorable he is. People may not pay attention to our message, but often when we suffer, that's when they're watching. That's when they're listening. God is worthy of our suffering. So if you love the book of Romans, but you don't long for the nations to obey Christ, then you you miss the book of Romans. You miss why he was writing it. You miss the heart of God. And if you're here today and you're, say, I don't have really any interest in suffering, giving, maybe not even praying. I'm not a a Christian. I, I don't have interest in what you're saying. The message to you wouldn't be a whole lot different. Christ Jesus, what he calls people to come to himself, and what he says at the beginning In many ways, it's the same at the end. He says, if anyone wants to come after me, he said, take your cross, deny yourself, take your cross, and follow me. It's basically, it's death to self. That's what the cross was. If you want to come after him, you say, well, I have no interest in that. And this is what he says. If you try to hold on to your life, he says, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for his sake in the gospel, he says, you will find life. So what does it profit a man if he gained the whole world and he lost his soul? And so the message, in many ways, it's the same. Is Christ is worthy. He is worthy of all of our obedience, our honor, our allegiance. 
all our effort. So let's give him praise. Let's pray to him now. Our Father, we come to you and ask that you would help your word penetrate our hearts. Show us, Lord, those areas that we don't have your heart, that we don't have your vision. We pray that you would do that heart work in us to create in us a passionate, zealous heart for your namesake, that in that way we would be like Paul, that we would desire your name to be honored and that we would see clearly what is our part, what part do we play in this great cause. Help us to structure our life with this in mind, that it would guide our church and that it would direct our path. Lord, that you would be honored amongst all nations, for you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen.